We are recording now. Good evening. Uh, welcome to Albany Cuba Solidarity's uh, uh, seminar on um, healthcare in Cuba and on the work, uh, the wonderful work that Cuba has been doing uh, for now 60 years throughout the world in a, with its um, international medical missions. We're fortunate to have tonight a, a, a wonderful panel with three very well-informed uh, panelists. All of them have uh, written uh, and written recently about Cuba's and Cuba's healthcare system. Albany Cuba Solidarity is uh, works as its name suggests on the capital region of New York. Uh, that's upstate uh, New York. And uh, we've been working for about a dozen years. We've been working on um, ending the, the criminal blockade on Cuba and doing what we're doing tonight, which is informing people about the work of Cuba, uh, particularly its humanitarian work with uh, medical solidarity. We have a, a wonderful panel, so we'd like to just get started. Um, I'd like to, uh, first of all, welcome to our panel, uh, Don Fitz, who um, has just, as I said earlier, literally wrote the book on Cuba's healthcare system. Uh, he recently published, I believe it was in June of this year, the book, Cuban Healthcare, The Ongoing Revolution, it's published by Monthly Review Press. Don uh, has been uh, an activist for, for much of his life. He has taught environmental psychology at Washington University in St. Louis, is on the editorial board of Green Social Thought, and was the 2016 candidate of the Missouri Green Party for governor. Uh, we're having uh, some technical difficulties in getting Don's uh, picture but uh, we do have his slideshow, his PowerPoint, and we'll be sharing that on the screen now. Welcome, Don, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we should look at that first, oh, that, that's about slide six or seven. If we could, There we go to slide one. Okay, this is the one we wanna look at, San Pablo leper colony. Uh, you might've known that Che Guevara uh, was in medical school in 1951, and in December, he took a break to go by motorcycle through uh, South America. He was at the leper colony in Peru where he swam across the liver, river to join the lepers. He walked among 600 lepers uh, and he was not be satisfied just to study leprosy and to sympathize with, with people who had it. He wanted to be with lepers and understand how they took care of themselves. And this was something that formulated Che's ideas throughout the rest of his uh, career until he died. Okay, uh, I wanna go to the uh, first point that I wanna make is that in Cuba, what has been happening is a total change in the medical system. Uh, Medicare for all has just, was a beginning point of the revolution, but hardly the end point. Uh, it continues uh, social transformation and, and development. It, medical care transformation was part of, of a whole set of changes in Cuba that included the literacy campaign, sanitation, land reform, agriculture sal salaries, better diet, pensions, new roads, new classrooms, new homes, piped water, anti-racism and gender equality. So Cuba, Cuba was going through a, um, a massive amount of change right after the revolution. And the first medical challenge was to bring medical care, healthcare as a human right to those many people in Cuba had never seen a doctor before. And focusing on uh, providing health care to the population. Cuba was able to eliminate polio in 1962, eliminated malaria a few years later, then eliminated neonatal uh, tetanus, diphtheria, congenital rubella, post-mumps meningitis, measles, and tuberculosis meningitis, in, uh, the last one in 1997. While Cuba was doing this, it completely revamped its medical system and completely de redesigned it multiple times over a 30 year period. One thing which Cuba does is rely primarily on allopathic medicine, which is oh, basically if you went to medical school in the US, you would be taught allopathic medicine, which is largely cutting and drugging people. But uh, Cuba has also incorporated all sorts of traditional healing and preventive medicine into their system. Uh, 
And if you think of the demand for Medicare for all in the United States, it is basically an allopathic system, which does not include the broad range of practices that Cuba does. I think we're, we're, we're uh, I actually titled my talk, The Battle Over Healthcare, because we're currently in an enormous battle in the United States. It's not just a people, uh, uh, both major political parties resisting Medicare for all. They wanna turn back the gains of the last century and a half, including a minimum wage, eight hour day, unions, end to child labor, civil rights, voting rights, protection of federal lands, Medicare, Medicaid, and every other gain uh, we've won. Okay, let's go to slide, the next slide. Um, th this is sort of the core of the Cuban system. Uh, it, there it is, it's a consultoria or a doctor's office in Havana. Now, what, what I want you to notice is that this is a very simple building. Uh, and let's look at the next slide. Uh, you, this is when I went to Cuba about 10 years ago. You see the, the poster board, which they show uh, breastfeeding in Cuba, which is emphasized very strongly. And you see how it's homemade. It's the sort of thing which I did in high school uh, in the early 1960s. Cuba does not have the resources for the, uh, like the United States does. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, and what, what we see is the students who, they're the four, uh, first year student, uh, student, a fourth year student and a fifth year student at medical school, all assigned to a doctor's office. So from the very first time that somebody enters medical school, they're working with the doctor providing medicine on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, um, he, what we're gonna see here is students going from door to door during COVID-19 to distribute the, the, um, the drug, the homeopathic medication, Prevenhovir, which is, uh, helps prevent viral diseases. Okay, let's go to the next slide. The, oh, this one that I'm talking about shows how the, the integration of the medical students with the, uh, the, the Cuban health care system. This slide is a, uh, a, um, a building which is used for the committees for the defense of the revolution. They are not part of the medical system. If you read a textbook about Cuban medical care, it won't say anything about C the CDRs. But this shows that the CDR is connected with every aspect of medicine. Whenever there is a, a hurricane in Cuba, the committees for the defense of the revolution are re required to evacuate everybody in the neighborhood. So they have, must know every single household, where there's mentally ill people, where there's people with disabilities, where there's people who are not mobile, um, to get, get out the, the sick and disabled and, and people to higher ground for safety. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, which is a, a, a nurse at a, um, at a, 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 a polyclinic. Now, what is important is I have that she's worked in four countries. And what we're gonna hear from some of the other people is that Cuban doctors have worked all over the world. And so every time I talk to a doctor, they would, if they had gone overseas, they would love to tell me about their overseas medicine, uh, medical experience. Okay, let's go to the next one which is natural and traditional medicine. So even if you don't speak Spanish, you know what this means. So this is a, one of the many rooms at a polyclinic to show that they use a lot of different practices. And let's go to the next slide. Okay, here we have acupuncture, which is, uh, th this is part of the medical education in Cuba, uh, of physicians in Cuba. The consultorio, the uh, doctor's office, uh, physicians go to clinics, they uh, give decisions there and the, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail in this, but the Cuban clinics has, have transformed themselves every 10 to 12 years. They were transformed 64, 74, and 84. And what came out in 84 was the clinics are very strongly linked to the doctor's offices where the doctors actually walk to the neighbor, to the, the people in the neighborhood walk to the doctor's office and the doctors walk to their homes uh, to provide care. Okay, let's go to the next slide which is, this is Allende Hospital, one of the best known hospitals in Havana. And for a person going to medical school in Havana, he'll know Allende Hospital very well. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, you remember how plain the, consult, the doctor's office is. Look at this, do you see the air conditioner? Uh, do you see the, the TV set with a 500 channels on it? You probably don't see them because they're not there. These are medical students going to visit a patient in a hospital room, 
They do not have the luxury of United States, Canada, and Western Europe. What Cuba does is, since it's a poor country, it, it does an excellent job of providing basic medicine to everyone. What happens at Salvador Allende Hospital during COVID-19, right at the beginning, they did a rotation for doctors. Doctors would go into the hospital to work with patients for 15 days. They would not go home. They would sleep overnight. Then they would do a 15 day rotation where there was no contact with patients. Again, that they would be sleeping in a different part of the hospital. Then they would go home and they would be quarantined in their own home for 15 days. What this, the very first steps of coping with COVID-19 were to make sure that doctors did not work with COVID-19 patients and then go home and give COVID-19 to their families or the communities. They were basically isolated for 45 days. Okay, let's go to the next slide, which is a cost, uh, th this is a maternity home. Part of the Cuban health system is also think, uh, specialty homes uh, like uh, uh, Casas para Ancianas, which we would know as nursing homes. They're not exactly the same, but they're pretty close. Okay, let's go to the next slide, which is a research. This is the best known research institute in, in, um, in Cuba. It's a tropical medicine which Cuba excels in. And the, the medical institutions are a central part of the system. Uh, the, the, uh, okay, let's go to the next slide. This is um, a medical student who was taking at the uh, Pedro Curie Institute tropical medicine and notice this was in the very first days of COVID-19 and when United States physicians could not obtain uh, equipment which isolated them from getting COVID-19 and you notice how completely wrapped up this student is. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is a couple which worked together at the Institute of Tropical Medicine who were getting married and it shows them taking time off to be together and then with their uh, uh, suits in order to protect themselves from getting COVID-19. The institutes have been very important throughout Cuban medical history. There's, a, there's periodically a dengue outbreak in Cuba. In 1981, they discovered interferon alpha-2b to successfully treat dengue. And since then, uh, this interferon has been used to treat many other diseases. Uh, and let's see, it includes viral diseases such as hepatitis B and C, shingles, HIV, AIDS, and dengue. But now with COVID-19, it was discovered to be very useful in combating COVID. And by May of this year, 72 nations had requested uh, interferon alpha-2b, which is the Cuban drug. Okay, I want, also want to mention that, uh, that campaign against AIDS. That campaign started in 1986 when the first person in Cuba died from AIDS. Uh, the United States directed a hate campaign against Cuba, claiming that it was prejudiced against homosexuals and that's why they were quarantined. In actual, actuality, that was totally false because the first people having AIDS were, were, received it through heterosexual transmission because they had been in Africa. Uh, Cuba had quarantined dengue patients with no outcry and the US itself was even quarantining patients uh, with, with AIDS. Okay, what happened in 1991, uh, after AIDS had been around for a few years, the Soviet Union collapsed and this put the, the Cuban economy into a tailspin. The embargo made it very difficult for Cuba to get the medications it needed for AIDS. It had to develop its own medications. Uh, it just totally disrupted the financial structure for uh, getting medications. And then Cuba, uh, had, in order to establish its currency, it had to uh, legalize tourism which of course brings in uh, prostitution. So Cuba looked like it was heading for a perfect storm, a total um, infestation with AIDS. And what happened, uh, Cuba developed a total program, including ed public education, the government um, pro providing drugs to people, people working together with the National Health Institute. And at the same time that Cuba had 200 AIDS cases, New York City, which is about the same size as Cuba, had 43,000 cases. And Chandler Burr wrote in the uh, Lancet that, quote, Cuba has the most successful national AIDS uh, program any place in the world. And so uh, Cuba was successful in combating AIDS while it r r was rampant in the US. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, you see, uh, th this is people chairing a meeting it's a Ministry of Public Health, 
And what it does is to make unified decisions about healthcare, whether it's uh, dengue, AIDS, or COVID-19. And what happens is that people work together in Cuba so that medical students, whatever the crisis is, they visit every citizen at home and they see what their needs are. The clinic doctors summarize the needs and send them to the hospitals and to the health industry and the policies. Are, basically, Cuban health policies are determined by from input with every person in the country. Uh, in March the 2nd, uh, when coronavirus was still new, they developed a novel coronavirus plan for prevention and control. Uh, Cuba had its first, this was weeks before the first fatality, March 22nd, and the Cuba immediately had people going into uh, surveillance at home and it banned non-resident foreigners, which took a deep bite into their finances because that was one of the major sources of Cuban money, but they had to do that. And this contrasted very sharply with the US because at that time, Trump was saying that he didn't even know that, that COVID was gonna be around very long. Don't wear a mask, you know, do everything like that. So Cuba was trying to keep uh, COVID-19 at the local spread stage where you can have contact tracing. And they wanted to avoid the community sp spread stage where tracing is not possible. Now, people talk about tracing in the United States. I think that's a total joke with you, you know millions of people having uh, uh, COVID-19. There's no way that you can trace everybody who they had contact with. Cuba did that from the very beginning. And so the result of that was that uh, um, this data is from July the 15th. Cuba had um, 100, uh, I'm sorry, the, the US had 136,000 deaths Cuba had 87. Cuba, uh, US population is 30 times that of Cuba, but the US had 1,563 times as many deaths as Cuba had. Okay, um, let's go to the next slide. Um, we're we're going to, uh, okay, this shows the uh, Cuba taking very careful um, tr uh, track of the COVID 19 uh, cases. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, and the next one, this is international, which somebody else, I'm not going to talk about. So go into the next slide, which is also international. Uh, and skip that slide too. This is Cuba and Peru. Skip the next slide too. Uh, this is in uh, um, Santa Lucia. Okay. No, no, this is in Peru. Okay. The next slide, um, skip that one too. Okay. That's Santa Lucia. Uh, which is thanking Cuba. Okay, the next slide is, is about Italy. Okay, so sk skip that one too. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's look at how uh, Cuba brings people to, uh, to Cuba uh, for help. Okay, this is a, a student from the US, uh, Jamar Williams, who um, it, it goes to medical school at ALAM, the National uh, Escuela Latinoamericana de Medicina, uh, the, 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 the National F School for Physicians. Uh, let's, let's look at the next slide. Um, th this is uh, the, the Braemar, which would, was not allowed to dock in any port in the Caribbean, even though it's uh, uh, part of the British Commonwealth of Nas Nations, the Bahamas, which the British Commonwealth would not allow it to dock, but Cuba did. Um, so let's look at the, oh, oh no, let's keep, keep it there for a bit. Okay, by uh, this year, Cuba had trained 30,000 doctors, mainly from poor countries. Uh, one of the things which a few people write about, but is not widely known, is that during the, after the Chernobyl accident, Cuba brought uh, 25,000 patients, mostly children, to Cuba for uh, treatment. And so Cuba had brought so many people to Cuba for treatment that allowing the ship Braemar to dock in Cuban waters was not uh, unusual. Okay, so what, what could we learn from, uh, what, what are people in the US done uh, about Cuban medicine? I wanna mention the birthing project. In 1988, Catherine Hull Trujillo of Albuquerque, New Mexico, developed a project for African-American women to connect uh, for birthing and to connect with infant during the first year of the infant's life. And they do hands-on work. And she told me in an interview that, uh, that the, Let's let's back up a little bit. Okay, that the people in Cuba uh, the, who have been studying at Alam are the, one of the best places they love to come to is the birthing project. 
there's another Cuban graduate who I don't have a slide for um, named Melissa Barber, who looked at uh, during COVID-19, she realized that the main problem of the, in the United States is that people have to go to agencies while in Cuba, the, uh, the government goes to the people. And this is what Cuba did in one of their transformations of the, um, uh, of the polyclinics, make sure that every polyclinic went to the neighborhood to contact people. And so uh, Melissa Barber has worked a lot with discovering what sort of resources people need, whether they need uh, groceries, whether they need personal protective equipment, medications, or whatever. Okay. Um, the uh, examples that I want to, uh, one example that I want to use is the United States is ravaged by obesity. It is one of the major health factors uh, in the United States, major risk factors. And so if you see, if you watch TV like I do, you see advertisements for clinics, which basically put the blame on the individual for, and, and says, well, if you work out in a gym, you won't be overweight, when actually how much you work out has very little to do with weight. The problem with obesity in the United States is overprocessed food and excessive corn syrup. Uh, and food which is basically designed to make people addicted to the worst possible food. So if we wanted to take, go beyond capitalist control of medicine, one of the first things we would do is to rein in all the massive junk food, really advertising for people to go to uh, the fast food restaurants is like encouraging people to, uh, to take heroin. Or, you know, if you, if you go into a, a counter, at the, uh, you know, going to the grocery store, they have the, the candies and all the sweets right by the counter. That's another way that the U.S. does exactly the opposite. Okay, now we can go to the cover of the book. This is what I wrote. Now, you know, I encourage everybody to get a uh, copy. And I just want to summarize, you, you know, the, the main points of, uh, of healthcare for, uh, for Cuba. Um, there's four principles that I've tried to illustrate when discussing this. Principle one is that everybody should receive healthcare as a human right. Principle two is that in Cuba, all parts of the, uh, of the health system are integrated into a single whole. Principle three is that everybody in the country has input into the, into the that's me telling me to be, telling me to be quiet. <laughs> okay, I got about 15 seconds left. Okay, uh, everybody in the country has input in the system because everybody's healthcare, everybody's reactions are conveyed to the higher level of healthcare. And the fourth principle, which I think is critically important, is that rather than forcing people to go to the healthcare system, Cuba has healthcare professionals going to the people in their homes. Uh, and Medicare for All basically is only the first part of this, everybody receiving healthcare. But the main factors which have been transformative in Cuba are ignored by both uh, candidate, uh, presidential candidates, whichever party they're in. So to re really get the sort of health care we need, we need a complete social transformation, including a complete transformation of health care. And that's it. Thank you, Don. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I, uh, I traveled a bit through Cuba and seen some of those uh, very rural uh, dispensarios uh, um, often I see the uh, physicians uh, and their family living in the uh, on the second floor of the clinic, so they're always available. And I have seen them traveling um, by cart, by uh, horse, uh, almost in, in, with every mode of transportation uh, to see clients in their home. Um, Don, I, I have to tell you, I started reading your book and and I'm learning and I've learned already uh, quite a bit. I, I thank you for participating and I thank you for writing that uh, amazing book. Um, our next speaker is Roger Calero. Roger um, is an editor with Pathfinder Press and is the co-author of the introduction to uh, a recent uh, a book, a recent translation of a book. Um, a book by Enrique Ubieta. The name of the book is Red Zone, Cuba and the Battle Against Ebola in West Africa. And that will be the subject of, of Roger's uh, talk. Um, uh, he's going to uh, inform us about the wonderful work that, uh, that Cuba did in uh, essentially stopping the, uh, the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa. Roger, uh, bienvenido. Thank you so much. Gracias, Pepe. Thank you, Pepe. 
Um, and thank you for the uh, coalition in Albany to put this together and everybody from you know, for being here. Good evening. As Pepe mentioned, I had the pleasure to co-author with Mary Alice Waters the introduction for the Pathfinder editions of uh, Red Zone, Zona Roja, uh, Cuba and the battle against Ebola in West Africa. And as he mentioned, I will focus my comments you know, it's like on the importance of this book and the work you know, it's like that uh, we do to educate working people here in the United States about, you know, tell the, spread the truth about the Cuban revolution um, and its conquest. Uh, Red, Red Zone, uh, Cuba and the Battle Against Ebola in West Africa by Enrico Vieta is uh, one of the books recently published by Pathfinder was presented at the Havana International Book Fair in February this year, before the whole thing was like uh, the epidemic uh, broke out. As the preface says, this is not a book about doctors, epidemics or medical care, uh, but first and foremost, it's about the solidarity and internationalism that are at the heart of the Cuban revolution. It's the story of the 256 Six. selfless Cuban doctors, nurses, and healthcare technicians who played a decisive role in eradicating the worst outbreak on record of the Ebola virus in three West African countries in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, Guinea Conakry. In August, September of 2014, uh, when the cases of Ebola were growing exponentially, uh, Cuba responded to the appeal for help made by the UN General Secretary and the head of the World Health Organization, as well as from the governments of the three countries. Um, and within three days of a call from the UN Secretary General to Cuban President Raul Castro asking for help, more than 12,000, more than 12,000 Cuban medical professionals had volunteered to go and join the fight against Ebola. Now, for the Cuban people and their communist leadership, such a response was nothing new. It was one more example of the political course uh, that, began, that began with the revolutionary struggle that brought power in January, brought to power in January 59, a government that defends the interests of workers and farmers in Cuba and around the world. So Red Zone, in a big way, is about the ordinary men and women who have made the revolution and have defended it for all these years. In the book, uh, you can, uh, through the pages of the book, you can read very and see very vividly uh, the discipline, the courage, the joy, and the sense of humor that, that characterizes the Cuban people. Uh, but the sense of humor, courage, discipline in which the Cuban volunteers approach the mission uh, and how the political course and the moral values that their conduct embodies are an expression of the social relations that only a truly socialist revolution can produce. During the Ebola epidemic, uh, Cuba provided what was most needed and what no other country even tried to deliver. Uh, there, there was no other government, no other country that, that, uh, that provided doctors, nurses, technicians, to care for the thousands of desperately ill human beings and their families and communities that were being traumatized by, by the disease. And they went voluntarily. You will find uh, countless uh, stories in the book about the doctors and the nurses and the exchanges with their family members, with others, and when they were making that decision to go, real, real wonderful uh, stories about that. Uh, when the Cuban government announced that it was going to help these countries, it, it had an impact on the Cuban people. It affected the Cuban people very deeply. Uh, and when members of the brigade were on the ground in the three countries, millions in Cuba followed very closely the news of what was happening there and what was happening with the members of the brigade. Uh, they were concerned for the volunteers and they were concerned of the risk of introducing the disease in Cuba. But that the, the example that was set by the volunteers in West Africa was deeply popular, deeply, deeply popular. And, and today, 
it, it remains, you know, it's like something that, that many people refer to and celebrate. Uh, many Cubans were proud of the country's uh, selfless decision to help. Uh, they were true to the principles and convictions of the, of the revolutions, of the revolution. When uh, the doctors, the Cuban doctors arrived in Sierra Leone and the other two countries, the mortality rate for Ebola was over 70%. Uh, but the dedication and the genuine solidarity of the Cuban doctors and nurses soon began to show the results with more surviving, surviving the disease. Uh, before the Cuban personnel uh, arrived, it was a safety, safety policy uh, for medics from other international agencies, uh, Doctors Without Borders, some, some of the others that were there. Uh, it was their policy not to touch pati patients or administer IVs which is vital for the survival of any patient afflicted with Ebola. And it was inconceivable for the Cuban doctors and nurses not, not to touch a, pa a patient, to treat them. And they began with their, with their example, you know, began to change that practice. The Cuban uh, medical personnel treated the patients and their family members as, as fellow human beings, not, not as a biohazard. Uh, Enrique Uvieta uh, said in, 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 uh, in one of the presentations that they treated the, the, sick, the sick as patients, not as customers, something that, that we're very familiar with. Uh, and in the treatment centers, there were no differences between what doctors, the Cuban doctors and nurses did. And they explained in the book that everybody had to perform the IV insertions, that everybody had to wipe bottoms, and mop up uh, vomit. You can imagine you know, like the impression that that left among the patients above all, but even among his fellow uh, other workers, African uh, personnel and other international uh, personnel who was there. They, they related to the patients with a sense of equality as one human being to another without a feeling of superiority. You know, it's like that a diploma or a piece of cardboard gives, you know, to many doctors in other parts of the world. In the over, they describe how in the overcrowded treatments, as people began to hear the kind of treatment that they were that that were, they were getting in the centers uh, staffed by the Cuban volunteers, people began to come and 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 the Cubans will tell them we're full, we don't have any more any more beds. Uh, and you know, it's like they, they, the, the patients that said, you know, that like we would, they would prefer to stay there and be treated by them, even if he meant staying, he staying, uh, laying, staying on the floor. And in the overcrowded treatment centers, they never ask a patient laying on the floor to stand to be examined. Uh, the Cuban volunteers went to the floor, went to the floor to treat them. You get in the stories how they fought for the life of every patient, even when doing so wasn't cost effective. You know, it's like because uh, the, the person had very little chance of survival. It was like they insisted that if a patient were, were going to die, they would die with dignity and knowing, and for their families to know that the doctors tried everything they could to do to, to save them. And you can read story after story like this, that, like this in the book. Uh, the term uh, triage that has become very common, you know, it's like in the medical industry owners in the United States and around the capitalist world to justify leaving millions of elderly and the vulnerable without proper treatment is completely alien to the human solidarity among the Cuban doctors and nurses and among working people in Cuba. The value of a human life in Cuba is not diminished because you're old or don't have many years left of productive labor. You know, like it is for the capitalist families here in the United States where the lives of workers they can no longer exploit have no value. And we saw that time and time again in the cruel treatment of residents of nursing homes here in New York, in Seattle and around the country. In Cuba, they did the opposite. They do the opposite. They educate young people to value the contributions of the older generations, as we have seen with the thousands of youth participating in house visits, checking up on the elderly, running the errands, 
you know, and, and checking up on the most vulnerable during the, the, the COVID epidemic. Uh, at the launching of the book in February that was hosted by the Cuban Institute for Friendship with the People in Havana, ICAP, Ubieta, Enrique Ubieta said that the mission to fight the Ebola crisis was not the work of doctors working on their own, that behind them was an entire country and a revolution that made this possible. And that is what is unfolding today also in the fight against COVID. Uh, Cuba's healthcare system and its internationalism are products of the revolution. Uh, they, they can't be grafted onto the US or other capitalist countries and they can't be reproduced by people whose social relations haven't been transformed in the course of a revolutionary struggle. Uh, story after story in Red Zone uh, conveys, conveys that solidarity and proletarian internationalism. Now, the book is also a very effective tool in answering effectively Washington's slanderous campaign against Cuba's medical cooperation around the world in answering the grotesque lights they spread that the Cuban doctors who volunteer for medical missions abroad are slaves, victims of human trafficking. You've heard the, the, the slanders many times. And you no, know, Washington's slanderous campaign is part of the six, day, six decade long economic war that has been carried out by both Democratic and Republican administrations aimed at isolating and economically strangling the Cuban people. And the reason why they, they, the US rulers target Cuba's medical cooperation is precisely because of the living example of what a socialist revolution can accomplish both at home and, and internationally. Now, over the past two years, Washington has stepped up its economic sanctions to restrict, restrict Cuba's uh, import of oil uh, and other supplies, uh, access to hard currency. It has limited direct flights to Cuba. It has restricted uh, the family remittances from Cuban Americans. And, and the squeeze has a real impact on the, econom on the economy on a, on a daily life. When we were there in February, however, for the Havana Book Fair, it was quite striking to see the widespread mood of determination to resist, to resist this pressure, these imperialist pressures, and the lack of illusions that the US economic war is going to be eased anytime soon or by a Democratic Party administration. Many people will tell you they've tried, they've tried to defeat us for 60 years, 12 administrations in a row, and they won't succeed this time either. You know, there, there are shortages of fuel, medicines, uh, basic items, you know, more limited bus transportation. This was before the, the, the epidemic started. But as you have continued to see in the coverage on the, on the Cuban press, you know, as like another media, there's been no shortage of human creativity and solidarity during the pandemic and in confronting the economic challenges they're facing. They're making sure that no one's left on their own and that everybody receives a prop, appropriate, appropriate uh, medical care. Now, the other thing we saw back in February is, is the outrage that, that provoked by the US, that, was, that the US rulers attacks on cu Cuba's internationalism uh, provoked among working people there and the pride in the, in, in the examples of the tens of thousands of volunteer doctors serving around the world. Uh, I was glad to see some of the pictures that, uh, that, uh, that Don had, you know, uh, showing some of the welcoming of the brigades, the welcomings that they have received when they, when they returned from abroad from fighting the COVID, the COVID epidemic. You know, it's like, and that's at, at all levels, in, in the neighborhoods, the CDRs, everywhere, you know, you see that kind of welcoming. Now, this, this powerful example of the Cuban revolution for working people everywhere is a political threat to the US rulers and other ruling classes uh, around the world. And that's why they never cease trying to destroy that example. And, and that is true, whether it's through econo economic warfare or by trying to corrode the working class foundations of the revolution by exposing Cuba more to the pressures of the world market system and to their capitalist values. Now, what, working, what Cuban working people have achieved is in sharp contrast to what working people face in the United States and around the world. 
we don't, like Don was saying, the US, we don't have a system of medical care. We have a system of medical insurance. And, and one of the things that you will find in the book is a chart describing how medical expenses have increased in the last 10 years in the United States and how this is part of the broader crisis of the capitalist system that we're living through today. And it's part of the attacks against our working and living conditions over the last, over the last decades. And it's because of these conditions that many workers and youth are interested in Red Zone because the book offers political lessons and examples that can be emulated by working people there, working people here, I'm sorry, especially for those fighting for health, safety and dignity on the job, for fighting to put an end to the discrimination and brutalities faced daily by African-Americans, women, immigrants and other oppressed layers. So now it's a good time to use and circulate the book to get it broadly into the hands of those who want to learn about the example of the Cuban revolution or are new to the, to, to the Cuban revolution. More people uh, are, are, are hearing about it and, and they, need, they need to learn the, true, the truth about the Cuban revolution. Now, again, it's impossible to, to transmit in 15 minutes the, the richness of the testimonies of the Cuban volunteers found in the book. So I wanna encourage you to read it. It's, uh, it's, it comes together with, with a wonderful uh, package you know, it's like of uh, pictures and, and you know, very useful information for the reader who's not familiarized with the Cuban revolution. And lastly, I just want to invite you to a program of the Militant Labor Forum uh, on Saturday, October 30, 31st at 6 p.m. Uh, in Albany, uh, where I, I hope we can continue the conversation that will start today. And there you can also buy a copy of the book, which you, I guarantee you will enjoy. Once again, uh, thank you, you know, Jose, for, for putting this thing together and, and look forward to the conversation. So thanks. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Roher. Uh, the, the work of uh, the Cuban brigades in uh, Western Africa are nothing short of heroic, combating a, a new disease, a highly contagious disease. And, and it, it stood in sharp contrast with the uh, medical personnel that went from other countries. And, and uh, I think you did a wonderful job at describing the contrast between the work that the Cuban uh, doctors and other medical personnel did and uh, in comparison with what, for instance, the American uh, physicians that went to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Western Africa, um, mostly provided some facilities and, and try to keep uh, their distance from people uh, experiencing suffering Ebola. Um, I, I, I want to note um, this uh, program is uh, sponsored by Albany Cuba Solidarity. We have a, a wonderful group of um, co-sponsors. I'll mention them in a minute. Uh, but Albany Cuba Solidarity will continue to sponsor events like this one. And so this is a good time for all of you that would like to participate in other events uh, to let us contact you. And you can do that by going to chat, which is at the center uh, bottom of your screen, click on chat and send us your email to make sure that we can, allow, we can let you know about future events of Albany Cuba Solidarity. We meet the third Wednesday of the month. Um, and so our next meeting will be on November 16th. It will probably be either online or a hybrid meeting and we will be glad to let you know. And again, we also, if you send us your address, we'll be glad to let you know about future events like this one. Um, and, and I like uh, some of the, uh, the, the other organizations after Isaac uh, Saini's uh, presentation, uh, which is coming up uh, to, uh, to, to talk about um, their work and, and how they, their support for the Cuban revolution. Um, and I just want to mention what those organizations are. Um, we were supported by a, a, a wonderful group of, uh, of progressive organizations on the capital region that includes Women Against War, Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace, the Solidarity Committee of the Capital District, Oprah Hudson Green Party, Capital District Socialist Party, Socialist Workers Party, and the Capital Area Against Mass Incarceration. If I 
uh, skipped anyone. I, I apologize deeply. And please let us know after Isaac's uh, presentation, uh, which is, uh, again, uh, coming up next. So Isaac Saini is a, uh, is a wonderful activist from Canada. He's a professor at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Halifax Nova Scotia. Um, and, and his book, uh, Cuba Revolution in Motion, is, is, uh, is widely acclaimed. It's a, uh, it's a look at the Cuban Revolution since the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union until today. And he has a, a, an upcoming book uh, soon to be uh, published. And that book is Africa's Children Return, Cuba, Africa, and Apartheid's End. And this book documents the decisive role of Cuba in achieving the independence of Namibia and ending racist rule in South Africa. We're looking forward to uh, your book, Isaac. Uh, Isaac is also, uh, we've had the opportunity to meet him at the uh, meetings of the National Network on Cuba because he is co-chair and spokesperson for the Canadian Network on Cuba. And our sisters and brothers in, in uh, Canadian Network on Cuba uh, are doing uh, wonderful work in solidarity with the Cuban Revolution. Isaac, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I thank the Albany Cuba Solidarity Group uh, for an opportunity to speak about a topic that all of us are passionate about and about a country that in many ways represents a model that the world desperately needs in these very trying times. Before I proceed, I have to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Halifax or Ketchapotutnik, which is the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation, where the indigenous peoples here in Canada, uh, we're now engaged in a major struggle uh, to assert their treaty and hereditary rights that have been denied by the Canadian state, the Canadian colonial settler state. But it, there's also a very profound um, Cuba connection as well to indigenous peoples. While many of us maybe re are rejoicing at the victory of Luis Arce in Bolivia, uh, which is a tremendous blow against the uh, right wing and US imperialist supported coup that happened against Evo Morales, um, the rights of the the, the, de the rights on the, de the declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples, which is a very important international legal instrument, uh, was uh, was passed with this tremendous help of uh, Cuban diplomats. And Miguel Alf the late Miguel Alfonso Martinez, who was a major Cuban diplomat, played a major role uh, traveling from one in, um, indigenous peoples to another across the world in passing on uh, passing and getting that declaration passed. And of course, we know, and some of you are very familiar with Cuba's medical internationalism, uh, which predates what I'm going to chat a bit about here, which is Cuba's um, uh, uh, ongoing fight uh, against COVID-19, the pandemic across the world. But Cuba's medical internationalism through operations such as Operation, uh, through, uh, Operation Milagro and other medical missions has greatly enhanced uh, uh, and tried to contribute to ameliorating at the very least uh, the kind of impacts that colonialism and capitalist oppression have had on indigenous peoples. We all know we're living through a tremendous pandemic. And very early on, as, uh, as uh, was pointed out, uh, uh, Cuba had a domestic preparation for dealing with this campaign as early as January. They had a unified and organized national plan to deal uh, with COVID on the island. And I have no need to go into that. We had a very good presentation of how Cuba's healthcare system uh, created the basis and actually elaborated a means by which Cuba has been very successful, despite the fact that it engages in massive tourism. Uh, this is before the restrictions in containing and trying to control COVID on the island. But also Cuba has a long history, as we've all alluded to, to medical internationalism. And as we speak, the, uh, the image I have up here is a dated image. This was very early on. Uh, it, it only shows Cuban medical internationalist missions that are fighting COVID in 21 countries here. Right now, Cuba has over 3,800 medical personnel serving in over 40 countries, and I think it's actually 42, fighting uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. It's an incredible achievement. As early as when um, in, uh, I think it was in, um, in March, the, uh, the Cuban uh, uh, foreign minister, uh, Bruno Rodriguez, pointed out that this is 
uh, global pandemic, that this requires uh, international response, a coordinated international response. And so Cuba responded by sending, as I said, uh, medical brigades taking its COVID, um, it's not only its COVID-19 experience, but its experience in actually aiding other countries in dealing either with, pan with, uh, with disease or dealing, like as was pointed out by, uh, by the presentation on Cuba's fight against uh, Ebola in West Africa, but also dealing with disasters as a whole. And so he said this was a, a pandemic, this was a global crisis that required cooperation. And Cuba, with its limited resources, was ready and standing by to provide this kind of support. Uh, Ralph Gonzalez, who is the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the Caribbean, has described the Cuban medical uh, practitioners who went there to fight COVID-19 as lifesavers. So they have played a very significant role in combating COVID. In fact, in the Caribbean, for example, uh, they form the bulk of the medical uh, personnel who are treating people and who are carrying on the fight of, against COVID-19. So this image I have up here, in a sense, just shows you a brief snapshot at a particular time. Cuba has greatly expanded um, its medical missions. And precisely because Cuba represents a threat, as was pointed out in the last presentation uh, to, the new, to US hegemony and to US propaganda against Cuba, uh, to the idea that there's no alternative but imperialist and capitalist ways of doing the world, uh, of, of, of doing medicine, there has been an attack on Cuba's medical missions. Cuban doctors have been described as slaves, right? Uh, Cuban, um, uh, you know, uh, Medical uh, brigades have been criticized for not having expertise and so on, right? This has all been proven to be incorrect, even to the point where prominent, uh, we could say, monopoly media publications are understanding that not only has Cuba been very successful in aiding these countries in fighting COVID-19, okay, but that they have also uh, begun to also damage uh, US prestige, particularly in Latin America. So what Cuba has done with its COVID-19, uh, with 300, 3, 000, over 3,800 medical personnel serving in 42 countries, is once again, as people have pointed out, demonstrates its tr tremendous medical internationalism. This medical internationalism that Cuba is demonstrating in 2020 does not you know, simply represent a one-off and an anomaly. It's not something that simply falls from the sky. It's the product, as many people have pointed out, of the Cuban Revolution. And in fact, Cuba has been involved in medical international since 1960, when in response to an earthquake in Chile, they sent their first doctors. In fact, since 1960, more than 400,000 Cuban doctors have served in over 160 countries. And in fact, they have more doctors serving abroad than the World Health Organization. Uh, they have truly set a standard. And of course, people are familiar with the Henry Reeve Brigade, uh, which is about dealing with these kinds of disasters, which has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, it has been in, in, in Pakistan dealing with the earthquake. It has been in Haiti. It has been in Ecuador. It has established a tremendous reputation of serving humanity, which is why it deserves the Nobel Prize. And why, the, uh, and why this international campaign to have it recognized with the Nobel Peace Prize ha has emerged. So we've also heard about the Latin American School of Medicine, Escuela Latin, Americano, Latin Americana de Medicina, the Latin American School of Medicine, the largest medical school in the world. It was actually a former naval base uh, that was converted uh, into a medical school where thousands of people have been trained. In fact, uh, one of the things that Cuba has also done, instead of not only bringing uh, uh, students uh, from so-called underdeveloped third world countries, the so-called South, to be trained as medical doctors and then go back to work in the most disadvantaged communities, Cuba has also set up medical schools in a variety of countries. Um, it is a form of solidarity in which they it's not just simply a form of charity, it's about building the capacities of other countries in the face of the kind of imperialist blockade these countries have faced, since we can argue the, at the advent of global capitalism. Now, some of you may be wanting to read in more detail about Cuban medical internationalism. I put up some books here. You've already heard about the Zona Roja, the red zone. 
Cuba and the battle against uh, uh, Ebola in West Africa. Uh, I recommend, uh, for example, perhaps a leading authority in Cuban medical internationalism outside of Cuba is Dr. John Cook, a colleague of mine, and he's written two books, Cuban Medical Internationalism, Origins, Evolution, and Goals, uh, with his colleague, um, Michael Arisman. And he's also written a recent book, Healthcare Without Borders, Understanding Cuban Medical Internationalism. Uh, John interviewed over 2,000 uh, uh, people involved in the medical internationalism in Cuba. He continues to write on that. And then there's this also this book here, Revolutionary Doctors, that looks at uh, Cuba in Venezuela and so forth, how Cuban doctors have played a, a significant role um, in, in, in all of these things. In case of Venezuela, there have been over 29,000, uh, 25,000 um, uh, doctors who have been trained in Venezuela because of Cuban assistance. In Timor del Este, over 1,000 doctors, right? And I've mentioned what Elam has done in training thousands of students. So Cuba has sent these doctors around the world. And these doctors have been a very, very powerful uh, demonstration of the nature of the Cuban revolution. Uh, where does Cuban internationalism come from? It comes from, in a sense, a theoretical understanding, right? That there exist unequal relationships in the world. That is a fundamental inequality between the relationship between the South, i.e. the so-called undeveloped countries of the so-called third world and the North. This history of colonialism, this history of imperialism, this history of plunder, uh, that has unfolded, right? And so this is, uh, you know, anyone who's been to Cuba knows that Cuba has, instead of these billboards that bombard our senses uh, with all sorts of consumerism, they have billboards that educate, billboards that perhaps teach us about the nature of global relations. And so this billboard says, in the absurd first world, uh, the, or this, absur this absurd first world consumes more than three quarters of the energy that's produced. Uh, on a global basis, right? So Cuba's doctors with its very limited resources, right? The I poor island facing a criminal US blockade and uh, what is really a war, a war of aggression that's been waged for 60 years, that Cuba facing these conditions has attempted in a medical field and many other fields as well, but we're focusing on a medical field to address this tremendous global inequality, to address the fact that this third, the first world uh, is glutted on accumulating this wealth. And of course, the first world itself is full, as we all know, with the tremendous inequalities between, uh, 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 shall we say, a gluttonous, rich financial oligarchy and a tremendous amount of people being thrown into penury and impoverishment. So where does Cuba's internationalism stem from? Okay, where does the fact that Cuba can have so much investment in healthcare uh, on the island, in which you have a system focused on prevention, right? And a system, system focused on making sure everybody has access to healthcare. A system in which when Cuba was going through the tremendous crisis of the 1990s, the so-called special period, not one hospital, not one polyclinic, and of course, not one school was closed. Where does this internationalism come from? And there, I would argue some basic roots, historical and theoretical roots. First, I think it's important to understand that the Cuban revolution, okay, is rooted in Cuba's struggles of the 19th century. The Cuba's, the struggles for national sovereignty, the, the struggle for national affirmation, the struggle in a sense uh, to establish a country, as Marty said, as Jose Marti, Cuba's national hero said, with all and for all. Those of you who study Cuban history are familiar with these wars of independence. But 1890, the second war of independence or the necessary war as Cubans call it from 1895 to 1898 was not just simply a war to, uh, to throw off the yoke of Spanish colonialism. It was also a veritable revolution. And so Jose Marti conceived of not only an independent Cuba, but a Cuba that was more just with greater equity. As well as Jose Marti, we have the thought of Fidel Che and the revolutionary leadership. The Cuban revolution from the very beginning was committed to internationalism. Internationalism was seen as central to building the socialist project. And that's why internationalism was, was so much encompassed in the first and second declarations of Havana. Uh, we could go on, I've written a lot about Cuba and Africa, but Cuba also privileged Africa, not only in aiding it in fighting the, West Bola, uh, the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, but also in the fight against apartheid, okay? Proletarian internationalism, a fundamental tenant of socialist construction. Uh, Cuba made this an explicit sphere of foreign policy. The imperative of internationalism, 
that one could not achieve justice at home if one did not fight for justice abroad, right? That socialism and social justice were not just simply domestic uh, concerns and preoccupations. It had to be an internationalist vision. And internationalism is integral to socialist development. This is extremely clear in the Cuban revolution. Uh, many, for example, of the uh, people are familiar with Cuban history and in, in the voluntary brigades that uh, in the 1980s, a lot of the voluntary brigades are involved in constructing homes and clinics and so forth were people who had been involved in internationalist missions. And Cuban young doctors who serve in these medical brigades come back with an understanding that whatever problems Cuba has, the facing of the tightening of the US economic blockade, dealing with the economic problems they have at home, that Cuba represents a profound example, right? In which healthcare um, is not only a universal right, which education is not only a universal right, but where human beings are placed at the center of the political and social arrangements of that particular country. And when one looks at Cuba's internationalism, so for example, we have these 3,800 doctors serving abroad um, in 42 countries fighting COVID. Cuba also posits a very different concept of uh, international assistance, international aid, what we call interna medical internationalism than other uh, um, aid bodies. It's not solidarity, it's solidarity versus charity. It's an attempt to express that we join you in your struggles and we will uh, uh, aid you in building in building your own capacities, which is why Cuba not only trains doctors from other countries and sends them back to those countries, but also it endeavors to build medical schools and to train people to actually run those medical schools as well. So I say here, it's a different than the giver-receiver relationship, which is part of the imperialist framework, but it's all, it's, it, count, it counters that with a unified social collective solidar solidarizing with another social entity. Okay, now the last point I'd like to, add on here is obviously we're living within the pandemic. In the United States, we see cases rise every day. Okay, uh, we see um, in the Europe and other places, we see the crisis rising as well with the pandemic. Here in Canada, in the provinces of Ontario and Quebec, we're, racing, we're, we're witnessing uh, significant increases in the rates of COVID infection. And so one of the things that uh, we launched at the beginning of this year, it came out of the US, uh, normal, uh, US Cuba Normalization Conference was this idea of a savings lives campaign. Uh, this is a united effort between the US National Network in Cuba, the Canadian Network in Cuba, and also I should add here, La Table de Concentration, the Solidarity of Cuba, which is the Quebec uh, Cuba Solidarity Organization. Our goal is simply uh, arguing that this is to save lives. Uh, Cuba has extensive experience in fighting epidemics and dealing with these kinds of crises, and particularly in the fight of COVID. We've heard not only about Cuba's uh, treatment protocols and, re and regimes, uh, from everything to how they treat patients, to things like uh, Alpha 2B recombinant, which is Cuba's particular form of interferon, which has proven very effective um, in dealing with some of the worst aspects of COVID-19. There's a whole series of other medications that Cuba has also um, uh, uh, actually used in dealing with COVID in on the island as well. And also Cuba is develop, developing a vaccine, Sobrana 1, uh, a vaccine that perhaps is not receiving any coverage within the Western media and is going through several uh, trials. So this campaign, which has been endorsed by people like Oliver Stone and Danny Glover, and I've placed some of the uh, medical endorsers uh, um, on, on the on, on the slide here, this campaign calls for the US government and the Canadian government to engage in medical collaboration and cooperation with Cuba so that, it, so that we can save lives that needlessly not be lost uh, through the pandemic in both Canada and the United States. And we also call for the end of the US criminal economic blockade against Cuba, which is really an economic war. And our campaign believes part of the US-Cuba normalization conference that we'll, we have a conference on November 13 and 14. We also believe that we, while the blockade has never been more stringent, while the escalation of attacks have never been greater, that we also face the greatest prospects of bringing an end to the blockade in 2021. We hope we can do that. We're going to be mobilizing people for that. But we also know that Cuba represents a different model. It demonstrates that relations among peoples and between countries does not have to be based on the pursuit of power, wealth, but it can be based on true human solidarity, 
through human love, genuine fraternity and equality between the world's people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaac. Um, what we'd like is to um, provide the opportunity to Roher, to Don, or to Isaac to comment on uh, ideas that came up during uh, some of the other presentations, if you have any. Otherwise, uh, we'll move on to the uh, question and answer and discussions. And I know that some of our co-sponsors would like to say something early in the presentation, but I'm gonna let John handle the Q&A because he is uh, much better than I will ever be at managing the uh, muting and unmuting and the rest. Uh, so again, if Roher, Don, or Isaac want to comment on each other's presentations, otherwise we can move to um, some of our co-sponsors and then to the, the Q&A and discussion. Yeah, I have a brief comment. This is Don Fitz. Uh, I really like the presentation, both of the other presentations. Roger Calero uh, pointed out that Cuba and uh, Africa related to patients as human beings. And I just wanted to bring up the example of Haiti uh, that uh, John Kirk wrote about. And he called what the US did in Haiti uh, disaster tourism. Because when American doctors went to Haiti in 2010, they stayed in, they flew by helicopter to uh, luxury hotels and they stayed in those luxury hotels. And then they, they flew back to work with patients the next day. Cuban doctors live with the uh, victims of the earthquake. They smelled the same smells, they saw the same sights, they knew what it was like to be there. And in Cuba, the people who go to a doctor's office, the consultorios, the, the doctors and nurses know each person on a personal level. Now, when, the, when I go to get medical care, the first person I talk to and the first thing I'm asked is, do you have your insurance card? It's, it's really a different interaction. Uh, at, at a, a doctor's office in the United States in Cuba. And I, Isaac uh, Saini made a, a really good point about Cuban medical doctors being criticized. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring up is, is that this happened in Venezuela, I think uh, Brazil, but several countries, the, the doctors associate, the medical associations disliked having Cubans in. They said they were a lower, provided a lower quality of care and that they took jobs away from th that country's physicians. And this was extremely ironic because where Cuban doctors very often went, the first ones who would go would be to the jungles and the isolated areas and the impoverished areas where the, the rich doctors from those countries would not step foot in. So the entire concept of, of, of criticizing Cuban medical in, uh, internationalism is, is what I call a neglect projection. I'm a psychologist by trade and you know, projection is where you have your own unacceptable impulses, so you project them into somebody else. And what we see in the case of Cuba is what I would call uh, medical international projection, where the United States takes its very bad attitudes about an internationalism, about the worst that you can come by that nobody else really makes any difference in the world, and projects its own impulses onto Cuba. So I, I think that I really appreciate what both of the other speakers had to say about Cuban international medicine. Yeah, and Isaac, I just would like to say, I mean, obviously, you know, we have short presentations, but you know, the Cubans bring a different concept of what a doctor is. I mean, I remember Norman Bethune, the revolutionary doctor goes to the patient, right? And I think the point that was made earlier is that obviously these doctors come out of a different set of social relations, right? Uh, that's why they're willing to make these sacrifices. I mean, the United States has attempted to, through the CIA and through various other, um, uh, uh, shall we say, pro uh, nefarious programs to encourage doctors to defect, but a very small number actually, uh, shall we say, succumb to that siren song. I mean, the, doc the doctors say, yes, you know, they have to deal with economic issues in their lives, but they're committed to solidarizing with human beings. Um, it's in a sense where somebody said that, you know, in a moral sense, an ethical sense, it's a battle between the ethos of having, where I define myself by the number of material goods I have, versus the ethos of solidarity, where I define myself by the amount of human love, right? Or the, uh, I can extend to other human beings. Another po point I'd make, this is an important point about Africa, I think it's important to bear in mind. Now, Ban Ki-moon, uh, the Secretary General of, the United, uh, of, um, the, of the United Nations said that the Cuban doctrines are often the first to be there, the last to leave, and they never leave. 
even during a crisis, right? Okay, they're always there. But when it comes to Africa, the devaluing of black lives, and I come, I have my roots lying in the African Nova Scotian community here. The devaluing of black lives, okay, the devaluing of what it means to be a person of African descent is so opposite to what Cuba has done. Um, from its participation and the loss of over 2,000 people in the struggle against apartheid when South Africa, racist South African state, waged that bloody war of terrorism from 1975 to 1980, 1989 until the Cubans de decisively defeated them at the Battle of Quito, Juan de Valle. To the Ebola, as was so eloquently, uh, dealing with the Ebola epidemic that was so eloquently dealt with. I remember the Cuban ambassador at that time, at that time to the United Nations at the UN Security Council, he said, during the Ebola epidemic, that humanity owes a debt to the people of Africa. And the Cubans have often articulated this, that there is a debt owed to the people of Africa precisely because of the transatlantic slave trade. And the Cubans also articulate that there is a debt owed to Haiti because Haiti in a sense mirrors and parallels the Cuban experience. Because after the Haitian revolution of 1791, a cordon sanitaire was imposed on Haiti precisely because mm -hmm. the slaveholding powers and the imperial powers could not stand the idea that here stood an independent polity, particularly a black polity. And so Cuba has been well aware of the debt it owes to Africa and to other countries that have engaged in struggle before the revolution triumphed. Um. Pepe, if I can say something. Should we go ahead? Yes, yes please. Okay. One, one, one thought, you know, as I was listening to both Isaac and Don, uh, and well, to you, it, 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 made, it made me think about the numbers of people that you run into, that you run into in the United States, and I'm sure this is true of Canada, uh, that have had themselves or their relatives have been treated by Cuban doctors, you know, and and the impact that that has had on them, you know, it's like it's very common when you go when you go into the neighborhoods, you know, knocking on doors with a book, to run into people like that, you know, it's like that that says yeah exactly that, you know, it's like a, I was treated, a relative of mine was treated, and and the. The importance, of, the importance of the work that can be done in educating about the Cuban revolution, that this is not the result of some genetic thing that Cubans have, you know, like, but as, as we have pointed out in different ways, the product of the social relations, you know, like that, that are the product of a revolution. Anyway, it, it's important and, and the potential to win the potential to win allies among among these workers in defense of the of the Cuban Revolution, in for the demands of of the lifting of the of the economic embargo and the and the restrictions, which, you know, it's like I think that that uh, it's been said in different ways. You know, it like will not will, will not cease. You know, it's like until they they see uh, the, the revolution the revolution overturn. Uh, I, I think that there is going to be there there will continue to be. Uh, ways. I mean, it's the reason why. It's the reason why Washington is so has been stepping up. I mean, Cuba. Cuba is. What is it that, that the headline? I think it was the Washington Post that that used it, or or an AP article is that Cuba's punching is punching above his weight. You know, it's like the the they can't ignore it. They can't ignore it. But anyway, but but the opportunities to uh to to. To, to talk more to people about the, the Cuban revolution and its example are, are, are there, are, you know, are there for us. And like I mentioned before, you know, like, uh, this will continue to be revealed. The contrast will continue to, re to be revealed. You know, like, uh, and, and you're seeing it right now, you know, like as, as medications are being developed, vaccines are being developed, you know, like, and how will we'll come to the surface you know, it's like that, that big class differentiations, you know, it's like the, the reality, you know, it's like uh, that, that we that will begin to see more and more on how they will be, they will be dispensed, administered and so forth. And from that, the need, you know, it's like that the labor movement in, in, in each one of our countries need to, need to make, you know, it's like along with the question of jobs and for other protections against, against you know, it's like the economic crisis, the question of demanding 
you know, that a vaccine, the demanding that the treatments that have been developed for COVID so far be made available. And I was like, universally to the most vulnerable and, and to, to those of us that, you know, they call essential when, when, they, when they want to. Now, um, now the, the, thing, the thing that Isaac and others have been pointed out on the international side of it is that, uh, you know, it's like how did none of these things, science and its applications do not take place or do not exist outside of the relations, you know, it's like of capitalism and the, the crisis will continue to expose the class differentiations that determines who gets treatment and who doesn't. Uh, I mean, we, 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 millions will be excluded. You know, it's like in, in Africa, Latin America, Asia, when a vaccine is, uh, or other treatments are developed. Um, I mean, there's, there's basic development questions, but well, I'll say it differently. The underdevelopment that has been created by imperial exploitation that prevents these countries from having access to the infrastructure and the medical care needed. There was an article, you know, it's like, uh, on how he pointed out and the nearly 3 billion people of the world's 7.8 billion uh, live in places with inadequate temperature, temperature control storage necessary for immuni an immunization campaign. You know, it's like, so, I mean, this, these are this pose some serious questions, you know, it's like on, on working people in, in, in the United States, in, 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 the, in, in the UK, in France, to demand of these imperialist governments to supply vaccines and the needed infrastructure for the poorest countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And we will see that there will be a sharp contrast in the response of revolutionary Cuba, both in the islands and internationally to this. Just one last thing, you know, it's like related to, to, to this being a product of the Cuban revolution. I was reading recently an article about, uh, I don't remember his first name, Sabin, the, the co-developer of the oral polio vaccine. Now, when, when Cuba carried out the, and it's related to this question of the, of the uh, refrigeration and things like that. Uh, when Cuba carried out its, its polio vaccination campaign in 1962, which, which I think Isaac mentioned them, they did it in one sweep. They mobilized hundreds of thousands of people through the CDRs, the, the unions, the, the Federation of Cuban Women that was just being formed. Uh, the Revolutionary Armed Forces to carry it out. I think they vaccinated something like to, over 2 million kids. Uh, they did it in one sweep. And then they came again and did another dose and, and did it. And Sabin was, was astonished by the results. And he, he goes to Cuba. He goes to Cuba because he, he wanted to see it for himself and that this was not just some statistic that was being claimed. You know, it's like, and he's blown away by that, by, by what was done. And the article on, on his obituary points out how he spent the last 30 days of his life trying to convince governments around the country to do the same. And poor guy, you know, it's like died without succeeding in that. But that, that brings us to the point, you know, it's like on what it is possible. You know, it's like when, when what a revolution can do and the, the working people organize, in, organize and the leadership that organize the capacities, you know, they can the creativity of working people to do that. But anyway, uh, I, I think it was uh, 60 years later that the world declared polio after, after Cuba did in 62, 60 years later that the world declared polio to be eliminated. But anyway, it's this kind of examples that we can use to, to to point, you know, like to, to what the Cuban Revolution has accomplished and, and what we can emulate. But anyway, I, th I think it was a. I'm 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 just drawing on some of the things that the both of you, Don and Isaac. All right. Uh, yeah. If I may, so I think there's an interesting thing. I know we, there's some questions probably waiting, but it, it occurred to me that one of the things, and when um, it was mentioned about the Bremer, the ship that was um, part of the British Commonwealth that was refused to dock. 
um, you know, we see be, because of some of the conditions, because of propaganda, and so what we see is xenophobia beginning to rise in the world. And Cuba is demonstrating something very much opposed to xenophobia, right? It's this internationalism is opposed to it. Uh, and it reminds me, you know, we, when we were talking about, I have a friend uh, who um, is uh, from Canada who was stranded in Cuba and she's treated just as a Cuban. She receives a regular doctor visit. She receives all the medications for free. And that just demonstrates the international spirit of the Cuban people. And even, in, and they get back to your point, how they're able to do this stuff with the limited resources, even in the height of the special period, infant mortality rates continue to decline in Cuba, despite the fact that, you know, they face such stringent, um, uh, uh, you know, stringent um, shortages. It just shows what you can do when you have an organized, a conscious people organized on a basis where the wealth of that country is in the hands of the people. So I know we've talked at length, but uh, I guess there must be some questions out there. Um, I'm, sure the there subject. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of questions. Um, and again, I'm going to let uh, our compañero John Flanders handle the, uh, the Q&A. And I know that some of the uh, co-sponsors may want to uh, say something. Uh, and if, ne if necessary, we can extend till 9 p.m. Yeah, that's uh, fine. The, the Q&A. Yeah. John? Yeah, okay. Um, I understood. You said you told me that Nick uh, wanted to say something and somebody else, right, Pepe? I believe uh, Nick and Christian um, may want to uh, uh, to speak, but I, I, I didn't have a chance to check with them first. All right, Nick, do you, do you want to say something? I'm unmuting you. Thank you, John. Yeah, I will. Um, I'll speak very briefly. I know we've got some um, uh, questions for these wonderful speakers. So I just want to say uh, on behalf of Capital District Socialist Party that we uh, we very much thank Pepe and the, the whole team at Albany Cuba Solidarity for putting on yet another really fantastic and, and supremely interesting event. I mean, um, I personally try to get to these as much as I can myself and we always encourage our members to go um, and, uh, you know, just, just want to say, uh, you know, again, how much I enjoyed it and we look forward to continuing to work with the uh, Albany Cuban Solidarity Group going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, Christian, um, on, oops. Uh, or Jake? Oh. Christian, you need to unmute. Well, Maybe Jake uh, may want to say something and then we can get back to, to the others. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. All right, yeah. Uh, you know, the Socialist Workers, one of the co-sponsors here, uh, we find this to be a, a, the, the example of the Cuban revolution in this ongoing pandemic. It's an opportunity to explain what the struggles of workers and farmers can can accomplish uh, and if brought to uh, to bear in its most powerful form the, the revolutionary struggle for power and the the need today to build to break from the capitalist parties the, the the democrats and republicans to fight for jobs against police brutality for universal medical care those things can lead under uh the, the re revolutionary leadership uh, towards a revolution that can, can accomplish the kind of, of uh, uh, gains that the Cuban revolution has made about this, this revolutionary medical <laughs> medicine uh, on, a, on, on a larger and eventually scale. And I think what we're seeing around the world from, from Belarus to uh, Lagos in uh, Nigeria, uh, to Thailand, to, to, the, to the massive protests that took place here a few, a few months ago against police brutality is that there are millions of people that are looking for a way to fight and, and bring some meaningful change to, to our conditions. And uh, the Cuban revolution provides the example of the kind of leadership uh, discipline that 
that we need. And uh, this is an opportunity to to show what, what you know what it's accomplished. Very specifically and briefly, uh, uh, in in uh, the the struggle of the the nurses at Albany Med for a union, and uh, recently, you know, ho holding a press conference to demand the proper PPE, the 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 um, uh, protocols that would protect not only the nurses but also the patients. It's an example of how I, I think that that medical workers, in particular nurses and techs and, and things, are are seeing the 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 uh, fraud of the capitalist medical system now. And uh, this ex this example of Cuba shows you know what's possible. But but backing these nurses, fighting for the Albany Med, and fighting. For, for better job conditions, I think is, is a key first step for anyone you know, interested in advancing uh, this fight. Okay, and then um, we are gonna host a, a militant labor forum, as Albany, as Rohar mentioned. I will try to share it. I think I shared it earlier. I don't know if people can see it, but I'm gonna click the share button. I'll post the leaflet. Uh, it's gonna be Saturday, October 31st. I, um, 6 p.m. we're going to have a dinner and at 7 we're going to have a program. We think it's it's important people have the opportunity to join the discussion in person. Uh, we, we would love to have, you know, Don or Isaac. I know the conditions in the world may not And we will have copies of the Red Zone book available for purchase there at a discounted rate of $12. Uh, you can also order them online. Uh, and I'll post the information uh, for the website. If you if you can't get to to the bookstore, you can you can order them uh, that way. So uh, thanks to everyone for pulling this together, and and uh, I hope we can have a fruitful discussion here. Um, if I can make a comment, uh, thank you, Jake. Um, Don, I know can send a uh, an uh, autographed copy of his book. I forget now the amount, but it's the same amount that. Monthly review um, uh, sells it for. Uh, so again, uh, Don, uh, how can they do that? How okay, they well, there's three ways to get the book. One is, is if you Google it. Uh, let's see, um, the the one that comes up wherever you Google it is the. Uh, what am I? I'm at a loss for words. What's uh, Amazon? Okay, Amazon will come up. Please don't order it from Amazon. They just take a, a bite out of it. The uh, Way to if you get it from monthly review, they published it, so they should get that cut. The easiest way to get it is to just uh, write Pepe, and he will forward it to me, uh, and I will I can send you an autographed copy. It's a, it's the same way wherever you buy it, whether whether you get it from Amazon, whether you get it from monthly review, or from, if you get it from me. But um, j just tell Pepe that you would like to get a copy, and then we'll correspond. And people have your email, don't they, Pepe? Um, yes, I can address it to Albany Cuba Solidarity, uh, one word, no spaces, again, Albany Cuba Solidarity at gmail.com. Yeah, and I'll get back. Thank you. Okay, well, Heather has just volunteered to speak if Christian is not available, so go ahead, Heather, I'll unmute you. Hi, hi everybody. Um, my name is Heather Benno. I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation here in Albany. I've heard some of the speakers before tonight and I was really anxiously awaiting tonight's program. We um, were really happy to spread it to our membership and to promote it um, to make sure that our newer members could learn just how Cuba was able to respond to COVID um, in comparison to the greatest empire on the planet today. Um, so I think that this information is just so crucial to share. Um, if there are any materials that we could share after the program tonight, um, I think that would be excellent too. But I just wanted to thank everybody and to thank Pepe for putting this on and uh, encourage people, follow us on Facebook and on Instagram at Party for Socialism and Liberation, Albany. I, 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 I just wanna make a real quick comment. I know that I saw a few uh, comments on the chat that they would like the list, uh, the reading list that Isaac submitted. I will ask uh, Isaac, Roger, and Don to forward the reading list to me, and then I will send it to anyone that I have uh, an email uh, an email address for. Uh, we'll send that together with some readings. Uh, we'll send that uh, via email. 
again. Uh, so if you haven't done so, please let us know your email address. And Isaac, uh, Don, and Roher, uh, if you could please send me a reading list, I'll be glad to send that to everyone. Thank you. And uh, I just want to say something. Uh, you just have to Google John Kirk's name as well. Uh, he's done a tremendous amount of interviews, right? With a whole variety of different media outlets on Cuba's medical internationalism, and particularly its fights against COVID. He is really the leading authority. I would point out that if you use the chat, um, you can you can uh, post information there, uh, links and books and whatnot that you think is important. And uh, it's also possible to save the chat on your own computer by clicking the three little dots in the corner of the chat box, and then try to save the, save the chat to your to your own device. Um, so at this point, I think we'll go to questions and answers. If it's okay with the speakers, so they can stay around a little while longer. Yep. Um, I would ask you to raise your hand, which I think you can do if you're on the phone with star nine, in the or if you are on the computer, you go to participants at the bottom of the screen, and then and or, or and click on that so you can see everybody, and then that will uh, allow you to raise your hand. Well, let's try to do it that way. Or if you can't manage that, let's try doing this. And so that I can see you if, if you're on video. Uh, well, one way or another, we'll do it. Um, I would ask people to try to observe that so as to not step on each other um, the way Trump and Biden did in the recent day. Okay. <laughs> so let's go for, let's try that. Does so anybody want to ask a question? Okay, Anna Mullaney has got her hand up. It worked. Okay, um, thank you, Albany. And um, thank you to Roger and Don and Isaac. I am in here in Brattleboro, Vermont. And I'm a doctoral student at UMass Amherst in public health. Uh, and I also teach undergrads, which is why I'm here, because every semester I teach about Cuba to my undergrads. Um, and we actually, this year I'm teaching first years and we just did a week or two weeks. I do Cuba. Um, Don, actually I had them read your latest in monthly review. And I also combine it with uh, the film Maestra, uh, Maestra and the health literacy program. And I connect it to um, the Young Lords and Black Panthers because I'm, we're talking about community health and showing them what, what are other possibilities. The question that I have is that every time I teach about Cuba, um, which won't surprise anyone, it's so interesting to me how my students, I can see, them trying to work out in their head, how is Cuba doing this awesome stuff around health? Yet I've been told that it's a dictatorship. And you can see them trying to like work it out in their head, like they don't because of the misinformation that they've been fed. Um, and I try, of course, my class is not just a class on Cuba, it's a public, it's an intro to public health class. And I use Cuba as an example of what are the other possibilities um, in this world and what can we learn from Cuba? And I'm wondering if any of the panelists can talk about um, ideas or advice as, as a teacher when you're up against the deep um, indoctrination really of uh, Cuba as a dictatorship and um, the, how you can talk to students while they're also learning all this information to kind of dig deeper into that. I would just love to hear about. Okay, could I respond to that? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay, fantastic, this is Don. Yeah, one of the ways that you can, especially during an election, you, you can basically explain to students that in the United States, there's a di in politics, there's a dictatorship of money. You know, I'm in the Green Party and I get no, whenever I run for office, I get zero publicity. Um, I'm blanked out. So basically I'm suffering from the dictatorship, you know, of the money of the Democratic and Republican parties. In Cuba, there's no money in politics. If you wanna run for a local office, 
you put your name up on the wall uh, of the of the local uh, area, the political area, and you and you write what you would do for that office, and that's it. And if, and people want to talk to you. And one time I was in uh, in Havana, and we walked by uh, right by the consultorio, and the, the guy who was uh, I was introduced to. I remember his name, Jesus Hernandez. And he immediately started to talk to me like, like he was a politician and wanted my vote, even though you know, he knew that I was an American. But he had to tell me, explain to me why the streets had potholes and how they were spending the, uh, the money on medical care instead of uh, doing the streets. So, so everybody in Cuba who runs for office has to talk to people because they're elected at the lowest level and money does not intervene into uh, politics. And uh, sometimes I tell people that I wish that Cuba had a, a little more of the uh, authoritarianism that the United States does. And I explained to people that, I mean, Cuba loves their dogs. You know what I mean? Dogs run around everywhere. The dog, dogs run around so much that when you're walking down the streets of Havana, you got to be careful not to step on the dog shit on the sidewalk and in the street. And I explained to them that, you know, the, the laws in the United States, you know, that don't, that means dogs have to be uh, curtailed. And people just can't, cannot imagine that degree of authoritarianism. I actually uh, enjoy the cleaner sidewalks and the streets in the United States uh, with our authoritarianism and the libertarianism of, of Cuba. So uh, I, I think it's good for, if people ask me that, I have some concrete examples you know, of things that I can talk about. Yeah, um, Isaac here. Um, I think obviously, I'm in Canada, we have a certain advantage. Uh, one of the greatest things we've found has been, and I, it's difficult obviously in COVID and it's obviously difficult in the United States with these restrictions under Trump, but our exchange programs, right? Organizing exchange programs have been very good, not only in opening student eyes, but even opening professors who previously had very negative views of Cuba. That being said, I think um, uh, for me, when I'm talk, teaching about Cuba, and I teach a course next semester called History of Cuba, Hopefully I'll be doing that at my university. We might be on strike here, but that's another issue. Okay, so history of Cuba. And I always look at, you know, the, you know, everybody always begins with the tremendous things they've accomplished in healthcare and so on. So, and I use the human development reports as imperfect as a UN human development report are. And ask, well, how do you think a small country could accomplish this, right? When obviously dictatorships amass not only power, but wealth in their hands, right? How do you explain this? The other point is I look at this special period, right? And I look at the, at the debates that took place. Now, there were a series of workers' parliaments in 94, but there's also been periods in Cuba where Cuba has gone through intense parliamentarization. I call it almost a national parliamentarization of the entire society, right? We had it recently when it came to the Congress. So I look at these very intense periods which take place with an overall political system, but if these intense periods of national consultation, right? And I lay all of these out before I even begin to talk about Cuba's unique, Cuba's electoral system as well, right? The propaganda is extremely intense, right? Okay, which is why uh, people to people, what people call people to people exchange programs are very important. Because once people see the reality of Cuba for themselves, right, it transforms them in very profound ways, right? Another thing to sort of like what was just being said about dealing with, shall we say, uh, uh, Cubans are a little permissive with their dogs, right? Even in apartment buildings, I'll have to say that, right? But one of the things is that also, you know, Cuba has dog shows, cat shows, right? There's a whole plethora of things that with this kind of gray regimented um, the based imagery that people have created in the West, you wouldn't believe Cuba has, right? But there's all these things that go on, right? You know, chess clubs, cat, uh, you know, dog shows, you name it, stamp clubs and so on, right? That people normally associate with, you know, countries that aren't dictatorships that go on in Cuba, right? Uh, Juventud Rebelde carries a lot of very interesting articles. And uh, this, I, I think his name is uh, um, Walter Lippmann, for example, has a, 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 is developed this Cuban news diaries, and he's translating articles that people normally don't come across, right? About stories, about just the ordinary goings on about Cuba's, Cuban's life and so forth. I'm not, I know this is incomplete answers. It's extremely difficult to challenge the propaganda, but I think it's possible to actually begin to, to sort of um, chip away at it, right? By providing these examples, but I don't think anything and that's why I hope the pandemic comes under control. Anything um, is a substitute for actually taking students and for them witnessing Cuban reality for themselves. Mr. Babe, may I? Go ahead, okay. Um, I was just thinking a little bit on your question, Anna, and how it is, it is impossible. It is impossible to understand 
how it is passed, how the Cuban healthcare system or all education, cultural achievement have been possible without going to the revolution and understanding the revolution and how that began way before January 1st. Uh, I mean, the program that was presented by, J by the July 26 movement, you know, it's like on, on what, what became known as the, as the Moncada uh, uh, the document, you know, it's like the programmatic, the programmatic things that were laid out that were accomplished, you know, it's like at the beginning of the revolution. The program that was, that was later, later laid out on the first and second declarations of Havana, you know, it's like where the Cuban people told the world, we did it, now it's your turn. Now it's your turn. It's impossible to, to go to understand it without understanding that many of the things that were car carried out later after the triumph of the revolution began first in the liberated, the liberated territories you know, it's like under the rebel army. I wanna recommend another book that published by Pathfinder, which is this one, Women in Cuba, the making of a revolution within the revolution which is, uh, it's, it, it describes, it describes, well, through, through the participation of women, the gigantic accomplishments that were made, you know, it's like by, by you know, the, uh, organizing and leading the capacity of working people in the transformation of all the social ills and problems that they had, that they had inherited. You know, it's like, which are not unique to Cuba. They're very much the ones we're, we're confronting. But all the questions and the values that were instilled from the beginning, you know, it's like among, among workers and peasants there that were the foundations for everything else that would later carry it on. You know, there's, there, you, you'll find in this book, for example, the pictures, the pictures of the clinics that were set up on the second front, which was the front that was led by Raul Castro. Clinics, you know, it's like where you had the peasants, you had the rebel army soldiers, you had captured soldiers of the Batista regime lined up together waiting to be seen by the rebel army doctors, you know, it's like, and, and completely, completely free and, and so forth. But many other examples, you know, it's like, like that, that were, that have, that you can see through the entire history of the revolution. And, you know, it's like, um, anyway, the, 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 the solidarity, the, the, the respect, um, I think it's very difficult to, to understand it on, on and it's why, why from the beginning, you know, it's like there was a, uh, Isaac, I think mentioned that, that the sending of the doctors to Algeria. Uh, in 1962, Fidel speaking at, at, I think it's what's called the Victoria de Giron Medical Institute, Institute now. And he, he speaking to the class of doctors students, medical students, you know, it's like that, that the revolution was training right away because they had lost half of the, of the doctors that, were, that existed in Cuba that left, you know, it's like enticed by, by Washington and so forth, they had left the country. And uh, Fidel explains how they were, they're going to accomplish this in such a short period of time. And he, and, and he says, you know, it's like, a, it's only a revolution that can achieve such, such feats. He says, only a revolutionary people can carry forward such, such a task. But it's the same message that Che delivers, you know, it's like to young people, uh, medical students, where he says, you know, it's like in order to be a revolutionary doctor, you first need to make a revolution. So I, I think it's difficult without, without you know, it's like going, going uh, and understanding a little bit, you know, it's like, for, for now, not impossible, of course not. You know, it's like not imp it's impossible and it's even more possible today when more and more young people are being repulsed you know, it's like by what they're seeing. Um, but, you know, it's like, it, 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 I think, you know, it's like that those who can appreciate the way in which the, the July 26 movement under the leadership of Fidel and the, and the rebel army practice the politics, principal politics. They did what they said they were gonna do and they led by example. You know, it's like, and that's the kind of thing that today, you know, it's like in, in electoral politics and, and the, the bipartisan system that rules, 
you know, it's like we, we they they try to convince us that there is something better in, in one or another. But anyway, is, is the question of practicing principle politics and building that kind of leadership that can point to young people like the ones you're describing is important today. But I, I think there's some wonderful uh, things. The book that I mentioned is interviews with Vilma Spin, Acela de los Santos, and Yolanda Ferrer, which is you know, the central leaders of the Cuban revolution. And uh, they describe as young people, they, were trans they, they, jo they joined the revolutionary movement at a very young age and how they were transformed. You know, it's like, but that's not unique. You know, it's like to young people in this country can go through that transformation through struggles. Anyway, I don't know if that, if that helps. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, sorry. I was gonna say that's all really helpful. And I was gonna say actually, um, one of the reoccurring things that these students said to me that they're all about 18 um, this is more about the young lords, but also about Cuba. They were just so inspired that they were young people. I mean, with the young lords, they were like, wow, these were college age students. And um, they said the same thing around after watching Maestro, which with the young uh, teachers. Um, so yeah, thank you all for- you know, one, one quick thing, and I'm sorry, Isaac. Uh, yes, young people, but I failed to mention when I was talking about the value of the generations you know, it's like uh, it's not it's not just teaching young people in Cuba to care, but it is is how they they if you look at their pictures and Playa Giron and the agrarian reform, you know, it's like the the generations that came together. You know, there's nothing special about young people either. They they need to be led. You know, it's like so anyway, and that's that's the the importance of of you know. Anyway, yeah. so yeah, so just well, I know this is a big topic, and there are other questions here. But I just realized my own writing on the subject, right? And I think one of the things that you can possibly do is um, even begin with a discussion of what democracy is, right? The, as existing, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, cr you know, looking at what are the existing mainstream theories of democracy. That's people like in academia. It's people like Diamond and O'Donnell, right? What does this model say? And even by that model, right? Cuba doesn't do badly, right? Because one of the predictions of that model, this is why the special period is so important, that in times of economic crisis, extreme economic crisis, the legitimacy of any system is called into crisis. And that didn't happen in Cuba. Cuba had an economic crisis, but they never had a political crisis. And I think that's important, right? And then there, there is a deep philosophical context for the Cuban revolution, not just in Marxist theory, but going back to Jose Marti, right? So I, have a, I, I wrote about that in my, you know, I have to do a new version because my book is, you know, came out so long ago, but I have a chapter called Governance in Cuba uh, in my book, right? That talks about this and begins by looking at the existing bourgeois or the academic discussions around democracy, right? And then placing Cuba in the context of that before I get into a critique of the model and then even look at Cuba's, uh, uh, the philosophical and political roots of Cuba's own uh, political model, right? And I think that allows people to think, right, about this. Um, even by, you know, even by those models, you know, like the old models, you know, Cuban, the, the bourgeois democracy is in crisis, okay? There's a crisis in even these old forms and so forth. So I think there's a plethora of ways, but at the end of the day, you know, the question is this, is that when the economic crisis broke in Cuba, we all, this is, this is a point I always have with socialists, right? And the left, okay? In times of economic crisis, those crises are always resolved by the state on the backs of the people, okay? That didn't happen in Cuba. So that gives us into, insight into what kind of state and political process Cuba has. The crisis was not resolved on the backs of the peoples, okay? As to pose how crises are resolved in capitalist systems, right? And I think that's an important point, at least in my estimation. Okay, is there any, any we're approaching 8.48 PM. Uh, I think we've got time for one or two more questions. Does anybody else wanna ask a question? And I should remind people it's 948 where I am from. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, Isaac. No, no, that's fine. It was a long day today. I had meetings since right. the early morning. One or two more questions. That's fine. Just find a way to raise your hand or or uh, unmute mm -hmm. yourself if you have to. This um, is the highlight of my day. Yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you for thank all, I would like to thank all the presenters for an excellent job. I think 
that it's going to be very well worth uh, recording and putting on YouTube, which we will do shortly. I don't think the Facebook share worked. I tried, but I'm sorry, I don't have I don't have that down yet. Anybody, uh, anybody have any other questions, or should we wrap it up? Ash, I should. I want to make one last point too. This is related to the democracy question. It's always good to actually go to U.S declassified documents, right? And they're declassified US documents, like, you know, from the State Department, CIA, that acknowledge that the Cuban revolution, right? That the revolutionary days has deep-seated support among the people, right? And those always get suppressed, right? And so on, right? Um, so why would this revolution have some deep-seated um, support among the people if there wasn't popular participation, right? If there wasn't a popular stake in the revolution? So I think it's always good to go back to those kind of documents as well to triangulate from a variety of sources. Okay, I think we will um, we final we wrap it up. Um, if there are no more questions, I would remind you that you can save the chat with, with those three dots if you want to save the links. And I just posted Isaac's book in the uh, chat and also Arnold Loggett's book on the Cuban elections for, for Anna's sake. Um, and uh, if anybody else, I'll wait a couple more minutes um, before we end the meetings for you to, to save the chat. And I, I believe Pepe misspoke and said that uh, Albany Cuban meetings are on the third Wednesday of the month or on the third Monday of the month, right, Pepe? That's correct. So our next meeting will be on uh, Monday, November 16th, I believe. It will probably uh, uh, be on Zoom. So uh, if, you, if you put your email in the chat, we'll try to make sure you get a notification. I, so, can I just add one thing? Sure. <laughs> just because um, I think it's amazing. I, I once, not this semester, but one semester I gave my students the essay um, by Fidel Castro, um, we send doctors, not soldiers. And the student, I mean, students just grab this stuff up they, they've never been exposed to it and they see it. And if, if you're able to lay certain foundations, I think Roger, you were saying a lot, or a lot around this is um, they see, they, you know, they don't understand why I say George Bush would not take the, the doctors when Katrina happened. They don't, they don't get it. They see, and so it's so amazing to like open them up to other possibilities. Um, and get them to question that. So anyway, I just want to add that because that was something I was just thinking of. Thank you. God. And I want to thank all the presenters for taking the time to talk to us. And this video oh, will be Zoom more. meeting will be saved on. I think on there's one more question, right. John. Yeah. Oh, th this is Don. I just wanted to make a final comment. Sure. Can you hear me? OK. Um, and, and that is what I've seen in medicine in my lifetime. I'm 72 years old. And in the reorganization of medicine in the United States, it's basically been around one dimension. And that is, how do you finance medicine? The mm -hmm. care system itself hasn't really changed, except there's more and more control by big money, by insurance companies and by big hospitals. Um, but but the, and how you make a payment, that's it. In Cuba, the medical system went through fundamental transformations at the same time period. The first five years of the revolution, it was expanding healthcare to people who didn't have it. And then beginning in 74, they went through a period of roughly 10 years, for, uh, I'm sorry, 64, they went through a period of roughly 10 years where they realized there were still all these overlapping systems. And so they cre cre uh, created uh, the, uh, community, uh, the polyclinicos, uh, integralis, you know, the integrated complete clinics that provided the care there. And when they had those clinics for about 10 years, then they decided, decided to completely redesign those into polyclinicos communitarios. They said that the clinics did not reach out to the people enough, and so they needed to reach out to people more. And so they, they created the clinics where doctors would go to the people rather than just the people going to the doctors. And in roughly 1984, th these are the big years, you know, where the biggest changes were made, 64, 74, and 84, but they all started before those uh, marks and they all uh, uh, continued afterwards. But in 1984, that's when Cuba created the doctor-nurse 
yeah. system of doctors and nurses in the communities. So at the end of 25, uh, you know, 25 years of social transformation, people became closer and closer to the physician and nurse team who lived in the neighborhood. In the same period in the United States, doctors and patients were moving further away from them, uh, each other, as people had to go through increasing layers of bureaucracy in order to talk to people. And I can remember when I was in my 20s, I could call up my doctor and talk to my doctor. Today, in 2020, I cannot call one doctor. The, when I was uh, lo looking at, for a procedure that I, that I need to have a colonoscopy, I needed to talk to three doctors about wh why they were confused. I could not reach a single one of them because the layers of medical bureaucracy keep patients from even talking to their doctors. So the United States and Cuba are going in opposite directions, and that's been going on for at least for over half a century. Thank you, Don. HRM homeowners, did you know the... All right, well, thank you very much for all of you for participating, and uh, I think actually, we'll end it at this point. Actually, before you go, John, um, for, Anna, um, for Anna, right? Uh, I don't know if she's familiar with the documentary Salud. Okay, so that's also a fantastic documentary to show, right? I mean, it's a little dated now, it's over 10 years old, but it's a fantastic documentary. Sorry, John, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> you keep wanting that's to That's okay. Yeah. Here, everyone. Winding up. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, presenters. Fantastic presentations. And we'll see you all later. Okay. Good night. Good night. Viva Cuba. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank and you. thank you to all the co sponsors. Thank you to the speakers.